Here we are, the ATG Sprinter. I appreciate you making some time for us there today. Uh, how did you uh, how did you get into sprinting? I heard you were pretty slow at one stage. Slowest guy to ever touch a track. Um, thank <laughs> you for, for having me here. This is literally a testament that life is crazy and your dreams can come true. I'm on uh, a call right now with a guy that I literally would watch hours and hours and hours of content and educate myself. So super surreal. Just had to put that out there for me. But um, so the track journey was really kind of being like pulled into something that I really shouldn't have been doing. Like I was with all my friends and they were all athletes in middle school and in secondary school. And um, just as a byproduct of your environment, I thought I was also athletic. So I would run with my friends at track practice and track meets, but um, I was not naturally athletic like they were. So I was the slowest person to ever touch the track. Um, and it was super humbling and embarrassing for years. And there's tons of stories I can explain of how incredibly slow I was. So that's my background. And now I have massive goals for that. So you want, were you want to run hundreds or what did you, what did you, did you run everything or? Yeah, I, I tried everything I could to not get last place. I tried everything from the mile to 100 and no matter what I did, I was only sitting in the back of jerseys. I never finished before anyone for literally three years. Um, and so, yeah, I tried it all. But in school, especially early on, the way they pick your ideal distance, if you're a sprinter or a distance runner, is pretty much like, hey, are you naturally fast at the age of 13, 14? If you are, okay, you're meant to be a sprinter. That's your body type. Oh, you're not naturally athletic? Well, you must be a distance runner where that just made me a really bad distance runner. I was, no matter what, going to be slow. Um, so, yeah, I w ended up being a distance runner for four or five years, and I was competing in the 800 and mile and sometimes longer than that, and I hated it. But um, I did improve a little bit. So, yeah, what I can go into depth about all of that. There's a lot of funny stories about it. There's a lot of insight that in hinds, you know, now on this side of it, I wish I knew when I was younger. Um, what, but I'll let you, you guide it. Why did you keep doing it if you were if you were behind? Like, how did the, yeah. what you about it? Well, that was that's the fascinating thing. I had in the first two years many times where, at age thirteen, public humiliation is such a rough thing to go through and every single week I went through that at track meets because it wasn't just like oh you did your best nice job it was all the friends are in the stands and family and the race starts and everyone's like oh god whose kid is that and I'm just like trotting along heaving in a uniform that's falling off of me looking ridiculous so every single week I wanted to quit, but I was so lucky in the first couple of years that I had the best coaches and the best teammates and community. And my teammates would be screaming on the sidelines, like even though I'm in last place, just for the sake of work ethic, like try to beat your PRs, screaming at me like I'm winning the race. And it was the social pressure to not quit on those people that kept me in it long enough to where I felt just 1% improvement, and then I was hooked. Um, as soon as I ever didn't get last place, then I was now independent with my, uh, you know, belief and persistence. But for a long time, when I was a teenager, I was worried about other people. So it was it was a lot of good pressure that kept me in it. So was that like 15 or 16 that you started to like sort of see the light? A bit of like I could beat somebody and... I can get better at this. Yeah. Yeah. So I started 13, 14 and three years straight, it was a mess. Um, and f around that time, three to four years in, I saw granular improvements. And so, you know, when I started training with the team, this is just a funny story. When I was 14, they would break up all the runners into groups and tell them to go do their own separate workouts based on how fast you were. And they would say, 
boys group one, you're going to go run four miles here at this pace. Boys group two, you're going to go do this. And then they would say girls group one here. And then the slowest group of girls, girls group two and Brendan, you guys are going to go do this loop over there. And I'll be running with the slowest girls on the team. And I could not keep up with them. And I was like busting my butt trying to race all the girls that didn't that were forced to run track by their parents and I'm like so that's where I started and then after two years I uh I started being pretty competitive for high school so yeah I I was the slow kid as well like through high school because I was kind of a late bloomer but I was all right I was all right at cross country because I would like just put all heart in and actually ran like pretty high level uh, like for for distance stuff, but I feel that I felt the pain on the sprints, and I wanted to play uh, like field hockey, which I know in the states is like a girl sport, but in Australia, you know, we we usually top three at the Olympics, and uh, that was kind of the dream for me. But they wanted people to be fast, right? So I didn't really. Right. It was okay that I was in the country, but I wanted I wanted speed as well. My yeah. my dad actually came down and said, "Look, you know." Because the, the idea that speed was genetic was very, very strong at that stage. I was like 15 years old. I was, you know, 25 years ago. My dad said to me, look, you know, and my dad was a rugby coach, professional rugby coach, working with professional trainers. He said, look, you know, you're never going to be fast, but at least you can have good endurance and you can be able to kind of repeat efforts. And that was what he told me at like 15 when I wanted to go to the Olympics and they were telling me I'm not making the teams because I'm too slow. And I was like, oh, like that was, that was tough. Um, but then, yeah, like I found strength training. Is that is that kind of when, – when did strength training come into the picture for you? Yeah, well, I had similar talks from many family as well, but my dad wasn't a legendary <laughs> strength coach, so that must have been well, – not a, not a strength coach, but he's like a, rug, a rugby coach, like the, the tactical side of rugby, you know? Uh, so, okay. Oh, my – and that stuff of like – actually managing the teams like uh yeah yeah so he was the most credible source the worst person to hear from yeah so yeah. um strength really i was a late bloomer as well i was i went into high school and was not wasn't 100 pounds yet i was like 90 pounds and five foot one um and so i always dabbled in trying to start lifting and build muscle but i had very little access and guidance. Um, the, by the time I really started taking strength training serious was just out of necessity because I was so injured and fragile that I was just trying to find a way to get out of pain. Um, the first chronic injury was a knee injury that was just tendonitis. And, you know, in 2000, oh. I was 13 when it started and uh, it went on until I was 19 and I had surgery for it. And so in 2013, there, there really wasn't great information readily available on that. Um, there was like the reverse step ups and some variations, but it wasn't methodical and I wasn't sure why. So strength training came from that. It came from me trying to rehab myself. And I was a very serious athlete in that I meant serious, I meant well, and I had great aspirations, but I was a terrible athlete. Um, and so it just had to happen. Um, yeah, I was really weak. I didn't see much progress in the first year or two. Um, but yeah, it just kind of came as a byproduct of trying not to be the worst anymore. You know? Yeah. And so, did, yeah, did you... Did you put it together that that was actually helping your speed? Like, did you did you feel like it was making a difference, or did it? Yeah, I I um, always was a keen observer, and I would listen to the advice of anybody that was ahead of me. And so, the generic guidance I was getting from the strength coach in my high school and track coach was just like, get your squat bigger and and try to you know build strength with a trap bar deadlift and so anytime someone would give me a little nugget of advice whether it was good advice or not I would sort of obsessively work at it and almost take it to the extreme and so yeah I got really strong at well not at all actually I got stronger at things that I thought were going to help me and it really didn't but it I did notice 
some parts of athleticism built. And so I, I had the sense of like working hard towards your training does help. It does count for something. I just thought I had bad knees. So that was my unfortunate, you know, birthright. <laughs> so just bad knees. Um, clearly now we know that's not the truth, but. Yeah. yeah. So when, when did you kind of come across the, the truth, the athletic truth group? Well, um, I was working on my own athletic truth throughout the years of trying to scramble and put pieces together and what helped my knee and what didn't. And by the time I came across Ben's content in 2019 or late 2018, whenever he started, I, it was such a familiar thing for me of like traditional uh, protocols really don't serve the person as well as we think. And people are struggling in pain because I was that person. So I came across Ben Patrick on just a reverse step up. And that was something I became obsessive about already. So I'm like, oh, this guy's doing something that I totally believe in and understand. And then it's the rabbit hole of ATG. You start going into all these movements and learning long range, short range, and just the concepts of training start to change. Um, that was in 2019. And that's when I've completely like transformed my trajectory and health and potential for athleticism. Because by the age of 22, I already racked up a ton of serious injuries from the tendonitis I had surgery for. I had stress fractures on and off for two or three years in my tibias. I had a sports hernia, herniated disc, and I wasn't an ego lifter. I was just a hard worker in a very average high school and college strength program. I just did the right thing, how I was told to do with 100% effort, and I was broken down from it. So, yep, ATG definitely changed my life, and it, it's only been a couple of years, and I wish i had it when i was 16 but i i know there's plenty of 30 year olds that look at me and they're like i wish i had it when i was 24 so i i don't get too hung up on that yeah i guess i was like 36 you know so so came pretty late is long after my olympic dream had passed um yeah what, what did they do for the knee the patella tendon do they um do you have like bone removed off the bottom of the kneecap or what did they do Fortunately, not. Um, it's kind of funny if I knew anything more than I do now, I would have not gone through with the surgery. But all they really did, I had partial tears running um, parallel with the tendon, and it was obviously super dysfunctional. Uh, they just cut my tendon in half and then sutured it back up. And the idea of it is just to damage the tendon, bring to bring blood flow and circulation. And that's going to promote healing. Now, I mean, like a week of the sled, get blood flow that way, some short range work, or get your tendon cut in half with permanent stitches. Yeah, I didn't really know better. And I was eager to get back. So it was a surgery that definitely didn't need to happen. And it didn't work. I rehabbed from the initial surgery and then was left with the same tendonitis. I couldn't squat. I couldn't jump or sprint. And so I definitely wanted my money back for sure. Yeah. It's tough. I think it's, it's not something to my understanding that surgery is uh, generally a, a good pathway. I, I haven't heard of anyone having a really good outcome with the surgery on that, that specific injury, but uh, yeah. yeah. We do have lots of people now who say they've had something for a number of years and then often it's like a week in or a month in that someone's like, yeah, I can do what I couldn't do before. Um, it can take longer to fully, you know, to deal with different components of it. But yeah, there are, there are some pretty fast transformations. As you say, like this, the sled, the short range and some light stretching can, can do a, a lot for a lot of people in a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a whole nother level of paradigm shifts and like breaking out of the strength culture, especially when 
this is your field or passion, you become, it's easy to become very dogmatic about what works and what doesn't and what's sophisticated training and what is dangerous. And what we're finding is like a lot of the stuff that at first glance seems unorthodox or dangerous is what's getting people crazy results. And when you start to be open-minded, you realize it's not unorthodox at all. It just is treating the body with biology on its side with like, you know, things you can actually account for. And I don't know. I, I just know for myself, I went to college and decided to study exercise science just to fix my knee. The only reason I went to college was to leave my hometown and I chose the major just to fix me. That was worth the college loans in my eyes at the time. And then I went through academia and I bought into it and I was able to do some research with professors and I thought I was learning so much, yet I was still injured. I became more ego driven in my head because I felt like I knew more now and I was still lacking results in my athleticism and my happiness in my body. And so to break out of that is a tough thing. And that's why it's so admirable when we find, we have tons in our community, physical therapists who are 15 years into practice and they're able to go, you know what, ATG is game changing and they start adopting it and using it with their patients. It's like they're going, they're deciding to give up on 10 years of reinforced, you know, belief and be like, well, I was wrong for this long, but what works works. I'd rather make the change now. And that's a very tough thing to do for sure. So, yeah. It's not always, it's not always that black and white of like right and wrong for a therapist. They might've been like having an inkling of like, uh, we sort of need to move in this direction. And then they find like more clarity and, and more, um, more, yeah, more, more certainty, different progressions and things that, you know, they may have seen all the movements. So that's a lot of experienced coaches will say that, you know, like, yeah, I've seen all of that. Like there's nothing new there. But then if you actually dive into it, like it's, it's a different way of thinking about things that gets very different results. It's not actually the fact of the movements. It's the way the movements are put together and the regressions and, and the sequencing of things that is like, is definitely new. Like I, I was researching this stuff for 20 years. I had tendonitis from, you know, yeah. 15 years. Well, um, I had overuse injuries from, I think, nine or 10. Like my, my first thing, I had it, like the heel one. Um, but yeah, the severs, severs thing, but, um, it's, yeah, there's <laughs> the, those who, who do manage to like dive a little bit deeper into it and, and put it to use tend to not look back and tend to, you know, be, um, be heavily impacted by, it, especially if there are those injuries in the, in the background. But I mean, as far as like, now that you're, I guess the performance is more of the focus, like. How are you finding you've been training alongside Ben uh, yeah. down there? Like, wanna you want to be you want to be faster, right? Like, how do you right. see it from that performance angle now of like just caring about speed? Yeah, well, my idea of what's possible for me just completely shot out of the water as soon as I could train week in, week out, and not be in pain. Like the biggest performance enhancing a strategy. <laughs> is to just stay healthy so you can put in 52 weeks of training in a year. Like if you can do that year after year, that's, you're going to realize how much was left on the table before. So training with Ben, Ben Patrick is not the worst workout partner you could have, you know, he's definitely um, living what he, what he talks about. And he pushes really hard on the things that we talk about all the time and so for me to be in a point where like working on performance it's it's crazy so now um basically i'm trying to take what got me out of pain and then use it as true strength training right now and so my weak points in my past have been my lower legs um connective tissue tendons a lot with my knee and very typical like 
joint dysfunctions for athletes and especially in running. And so I'm not changing really anything about my approach, except I can really funnel in more intensity, more volume to where it matters. Um, and so for sprinting, that's going to be a lot of triple flexion, a lot of uh, really high quality hamstring work and Nordics uh, methodically over time. We're obsessing right now over hip flexors and we're taking it to the extremes a bit and doing, I'm doing reverse squats and monkey foot hip flexor raises like four to five times a week, kind of taking your squat every day approach. And that's just to sort of balance out the 10 years of squatting I've already done in cleans and deadlifts and trying to make up for some time with the opposite of that. Now, so uh, how's your body responding to them? Cause they, it can give you a weird feeling of uh, like the fatigue in those muscles and heaviness in like the psoas and lower abs region. It's like a, it's a strange kind of tension to deal with when it feels a bit locked up. Right. Yeah, I, I was nervous about it in the first week or two because I was completely new to that um, style of like loading with real weight. I was doing a lot of L-sits and more calisthenics base, the compression. And, and like, that's really something, the cramping you get, but it's not the same as loading hardcore over time. But surprisingly, um, the recovery on it is great. I think it's just so muscular and it's like the, the metabolic aspect of it allows you to recover there's not tons of tendon demands in that area it is a little worrying that like there's a lot of connective tissue and like the lower ab wall is something i've had issues with i had a sports hernia but it honestly feels great the only concern is that i have to balance it out with enough long range work and stretching because i do get tight like a couch stretch gets very difficult for me if i don't do anything throughout the week um, for, you know, mobility wise, but yeah, it's been going fine so far. Very cool. And so are you, uh, are you doing much sprinting at the moment? Yeah, about once a week. Um, and the reason why is I'm trying to go at this with a, a very long-term approach and what me and Ben have been really working on lately and trying to get our minds right on is like, what is the best long-term strategy to developing a sprinter? Because right now, if I started sprinting two to three times a week and I was pushing to maybe run a fast time in three months, I could probably do really decent for myself. Um, but I still have a long ways to go before I could be world-class. And so I'm going to need a different body <laughs> with completely different qualities and properties and so just for the sake of like my training right now i'm putting more emphasis on building the the hardware not the software you know like building the framework and my my tendons ligaments and uh you know everything that would break down through sprinting i'm trying to just completely double down for probably the next year I'll continue sprinting 52 sprint sessions in a year. It's pretty good. If you stick with once a week, um, around track time, I might need more specific work and the whole technical side of blocks and your drive phase and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, sprinting is, is sort of like jumping and that you want to get good at it. You might think that you just have to do it more than anyone else. Um, but just look at the guys that are beating you in a race. They probably have some key distinctions you could pay attention to, and it's probably easy to spot on their physique or their strength in certain areas, um, or their resiliency and ability to just never get injured. Like that's where you should work to develop, um, the changes, you know, I'm not just squeezing out any bit of speed gains over the next 12 weeks so yeah that makes sense so what um what 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 event have you going focused like is it to run a like the indoor 60 or is it the 100 or is it the 200 like 400 what do you yeah so i'm i'm focusing on the 400 for sure um i think the longer the distance the better shot i have just based on the 10 years of aerobic work like my 
my weakness is speed. And so as an ATG sprinter, that's kind of the oxymoron and I'm trying to work on that. But uh, I'm going to run everything just because I love it and it's, it's cool and I like tracking progress, but probably going to focus on long sprints, 200, 400. So it'll be fun to see for sure. And what's, what's your best uh, time so far? If you don't mind sharing. So the last meet I ran that's official times was even before ATG and it's not good. 400, I ran a 52.8 and a 200, I think I ran a 23.7. I ran an 800 in that meet too, it was a 205. Um, so a pretty average D2 runner. And that was two years ago. I looked different. I felt different. My body was not the same as it is now. So I'm a little anxious to go run a meet right now to see, but yeah, I'm expecting to be. Extremely, but it's like, as you say, it's not in, in the U S track is competitive. If you want to be a div one college athlete in the, in those events, like it's um, pretty much means you're, you're right on the edge of world-class like where, you know, cause the U S Olympians are, are usually so far ahead. Like the top college athletes would probably qualify for the Olympics in, for most other countries, especially like the smaller countries, right? Like, so you, you got that standard in the States. That's uh, super high. What, what, what's your best hundred? I only ran one in my life and I think it was an 11, seven, which, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't even think I knew how to use blocks then. I, uh, I would be really upset if I couldn't break 11 soon if I ran a meet and wouldn't be close to low 11 and break it. I mean, it's easy to say that you got to walk the walk, but. What's yeah. What, what would you see? Like if you compared what you're doing in the weight room then to like what you're doing now, like where, where would you say the biggest changes would be? And it's, it's a lot. Um, some of the movements are the same. You know, I used to squat a lot back then, um, but I would do German volume training with such low quality reps. I would do with a hundred kilos, I would try to get through 10 by 10 workouts. And my, it was just a different squat compared to now. And so yeah. I was just putting garbage volume on and trying to just, I had the training background too, as an athlete, being a coach athlete is an interesting kind of duality. Um, so I was trying to use what I thought I knew then. And then as an athlete, I was also an obsessive, just work ethic I was trying to use. And yeah, I, I took everything to the extreme. I, I didn't have a good methodical approach. When I learned Nordics, I started doing them three times a week and I would do 10 sets of 10. I would try <laughs> like I literally, Oh, maybe not three times a week for that, but there were workouts where I did 10 sets of 10 eccentric Nordics and then tried to spread the next day. Cause I just didn't understand properties of yeah. tendons, and how that works. So <laughs> yeah. How, how'd that go? Well, I survived. It, it definitely is a blessing that I did tear something immediately but I eventually did run into this was a tough period when learning ATG I went at it with the same uh, intensity and focus of my bad training and I did injure myself on numerous occasions chasing a pancake injured myself on a Nordic behind the knee um, many times just from you know pushing way beyond what would have been quality form and intent. And so I've been through that. Many people go through that when they start. Um, yeah, it's tough when you mail, like the, the instructions are clear and, you know, the guidelines are clear. You're getting, if, if you're sending your videos into a coach, like the feedback is going to be clear. But yeah. if you're, if you're young and you think you're bulletproof or if you're middle, you know, middle-aged like myself and you think you're bulletproof, then you just, you know, you, you want to put everything into it and 
you know, hope it works. But yeah, particularly with the pancake, like if you try to hurry that, it's it, it doesn't end well. If, often for the Nordic as well, if you if you try to hurry that, it doesn't end well. So I think a lot of the fine tuning that we've done with the ATG system over the over the years has like been really powerful to help to avoid some of those those challenges. But um, yeah, it's cool to hear how, how you're seeing the difference. Like the mobility side as well. Like we were you flexible as a sprinter already? Like were you diligent with that? Yeah, so I I had some decent flexibility in specific places just because like I said, if there was any coach that said do this, I would take it to the extreme. And pretty much all it was was toe touch variations and a grab your foot and yank your quad kind of thing. And I had, I think, a standing pike, palms to ground out of high school, but I probably couldn't do a couch stretch. Um, I don't think I ever stretched my piriformis and actually got into lateral hip mobility. Um, the more I learned of strength training and just in my own like progression as a coach, I got more fancy into hip cars and pails and rails and all the like, you know, joint manipulation, which is, has value, but like I never did strength through length. I never actually trained to be strong in those ranges. So that is probably one of the top three advantages I have now that I didn't then you know um changes the way you approach everything with training and changes the misconceptions of flexibility or that's for me that's not I'm too big to get flexible and I'm you know all that stuff so what about you were you always pretty flexible do you have the mobility you have now because your elbows to toes on your on your uh pike so you're my kind of inspiration with that. Yeah, I've been, get, I've been getting that back. I've been doing some handstand work again, so I need that. That's what you really need, like a big, a uh, really deep pike for handstand, advanced sort of hand, hand dancing work. That's mm. pushed me to go further with it. I kind of got yeah. into Ido Portal and that kind of stuff, 2013, 14. So, yeah, that's sort of always had, a, had its place since then. Um, but I, I was, I think like you, like I was usually pretty good on the, on the forward bend, but then I, people kept saying like, if you get too flexible, it makes you slower as well. So I think I really stopped stretching uh, and, and kind of took some pride in getting, becoming tighter um, through my late teens and twenties, because that seemed to be the dominant idea at the time. And yeah, I got told that by physiotherapists and, and speed, speed coaches and things like that. So um, I definitely had to fight hard to be able to snatch and to be able to fully overhead squat. And people message me at the moment because I'm doing these squats. They're like, did you always have that squat mobility? I was like, no, no, no. I, can't. I, I was just like everybody else, like squatting halfway down and, and getting like shitty knees doing that. And I had to work hard to get the, the deep squat. I, I would say my body probably responds to it pretty well. I think there's like different collagen types and different maybe neural types that I, I seem to be able to like teach myself to get into positions fairly quickly, whether it's the type of collagen or whether it's um, something with the nervous system, I don't know. But um, most people actually progress a lot faster than they think they can once they start doing the right things and, and kind of learn what it, what it really is to use like the the range of strength or strength through length concept. Like it's, it's very powerful once you just treat it like strength training and, you know, conservatively add load with time get strong in the positions like it's, it's very very powerful and especially with the more background you have lifting I mean I've I've had friends and clients that were strong guys and they were really big and they didn't have any progress in their mobility until they started loading serious like they could do all the walks they want but these were guys like deadlifting 500 pounds it wasn't until they did Jefferson curls with at least a hundred pounds breakthrough. Yeah, yeah. Um, that it's really funny that you brought up the the like elasticity concept of like stiff and tight joints. Like the the amount of ankle mobility I avoided because I wanted my ankles to be as stiff as possible because passive 
tendon stiffness I thought was the way and I didn't I, I mean, it all made sense to me. I was reading through the papers. I was listening to the guys on the YouTube channels. And I'm like, yeah, I want it like a rubber band. And it's so funny now that like everything's improved, even my elasticity, even my bounciness. But now I can squat to depth. Like now I can not have Achilles pain when I sprint. It's just, you know, and there's yeah. definitely some components like you said neurologically or collagen types that might make it faster or slower for somebody but there's no advantage to being yeah everybody's going to get that with load if you put 400 kilograms on someone's back and 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 go into the deep squat then you're going to be in a very deep squat like at some load everybody goes into the position whether the tissues break or not is it is it is a different conversation but if right. if you know 400 kilos, it pushes you into the position that it's just simply a question of, okay, well, how much do I need to regress that so I don't break? And that's what you do. You just keep going into the position with a load that doesn't break you and you go like significantly yeah. less than you think is going to break you. Like I did a 110 kilogram squat for like 20 seconds in the bottom um, yesterday. And yeah, like it's, it is like a structural integrity thing of like being able to, to sit there and talk and, and feel comfortable and then, and then stand back up. But you, your body is, is going to become more accustomed to, to that if you, if you do it. Um, and the elephant walk, as you say, it's, it's a great movement for people who don't train or have, uh, you know, um, they've had a lot of back pain or they just don't have a strength training background. But for those with a strength training background, then like the Jefferson curl or even just single leg kind of uh, Jefferson curl versions, like variations where you stay in the bottom. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different types of ways that you can go about it. The slant board variations, um, if yeah. you want more of a special thing, but it, anyone who says they can't touch their toes, like give me a month, you know, like probably often it's like even one session, even one or two sessions, like, as I say, like with enough load, you, you'll get there today on two will you get like pretty sore? Will you maybe like flare something up that it bothers you then for the next two months? Like maybe then you need to learn about short range and you need to learn how to settle the tendons down really quickly. But like, yeah, the, nobody can't do it. It's just a question of time and load. Yeah. And, and what I think is fascinating is like, I don't think we should try to utilize restriction as an advantage when there's definitely a better way and take I get sometimes messages from power lifters that will ask about like I should I try to get a really stiff thoracic spine like I think that it's best to just maintain stiffness and bracing to have as little mobility in that area as possible and it's like well what do you think would be the best advantage to be a stiff board that's ready to snap or to be like bamboo that is strong, pliable, but you built up internal structural strength, you're gonna have better results long-term for your actual sport and just life, you know? And uh, yeah, it's, I was the same way. That's the same ideology of like that stiff angles let you be on springs, you know? And it's, there's better options for sure. That's not how the human body works. I don't think it wants to be stiff and in pain but with the specificity of, of powerlifting it is possible that you put yourself in that cast and you live in that cast for the rest of your life or you, you know for 30 40 years and you just you just brace and you maintain neutral spine like it is possible and i know athletes you know powerlifters who are super strong and that's what they do and they don't have bad backs they don't have injured backs yeah. but yeah they, they, they're extremely dysfunctional as far as like a normal human goes like they can't tie the shoelaces like a normal human, but they're, you know, world-class in their sport or, or at least a national level. But yeah, yeah you also see in weightlifting, those, those guys are squatting like similar weights, comparable weights, you know, all the way down and they can pause in the bottom and they can do pancake. So there's not, not one way of doing that. You can make the decision of like, if you're a powerlifter, you can make the decision of like, I'm just going to brace for the rest of my life. Um, but for athletes, for, for anyone who needs to get into different positions, it's not an option. Like it's a short-term option right. to maybe take pain. I think that's where a lot of the research comes from pain and chronic injury 
but at some point you want to be able to live and use the body in the way that a baby can use it in the way that a child can use it. Like that's, that's always my litmus is like, if a five-year-old can do it, then it's right. Like if a five-year-old can jump off something that's twice their, their height and, and like not even think twice about it, not need to warm up. Like that's yeah. what the human body is meant to be able to do. If they can pick up something that's twice their body weight without thinking about it with a round back and they don't think twice, like then that's what the body's meant to be able to do. And we just lose those abilities because we train, like we train or we don't, you know, we don't move, we don't lift um, in the way that we were, you know, we would have if we had been on the planet 5,000 years ago, like we, we wouldn't have had an option. We would have been chopping trees and dragging things and carrying beasts and, and whatever we were doing. Um, yeah. But yeah. Ben actually put out a really cool podcast episode about exactly what you said. He was looking at Onyx, his son, and he said that seeing him just maneuver in these positions and roll and be on his knees and then it's like in all these awkward places, he's unable to hurt himself. Like he has the mobility and just non restriction that he literally can't hurt himself. However, the outside world can hurt him because he doesn't have the underlying strength and protection. So Ben was saying he's trying to be more like Onyx with his mobility and with his overall capacity, pound for pound strength and everything you said, while actually building up for protection and basketball and life and whatever we need. So if you can mesh what we were born with and not mess that up and then build on top of that to protect from the outside world and you can't internally hurt yourself, that's pretty good. You know, uh, there's a lot of guys that squat 400 pounds and they do that without hurting themselves. But if they were to maybe bend down the wrong way, they twinge their back and I've been there. And also I just want to clarify about the powerlifting comment. I know I'm not qualified to talk about powerlifting. I, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm totally out of scope. I am not strong, but it's just, I'm, I'm here for you guys. I'm here for the powerlifters. I'm just saying, I think there's an even better way, but I also may not know what the heck I'm talking about <laughs> with that. Maybe you and I, maybe you and I don't uh, fit in that category, but um, there's uh, Dawson Windham. I don't know if you've had contact with, with him. He's, uh, no, he he's, is. Push, uh, he's pushing for some world records in, in powerlifting. Like he's right up around the, the, those marks and yeah, he's, he's, he's super fast and powerful, but he said that since he's been using ATG and he can do like dislocates with the bar and he, he can do, you know, all sorts of stuff. He's extremely muscular. Um, and yeah, like it's, it's only, it's been very helpful for him in coming back. It was first from a knee surgery, but now he uses it like as a whole body system. And he sort of said like, it feels like I'm already warmed up when I go into the gym, like compared to, you know, what he, what he used to feel like. Um, yeah. I, I look forward to, uh, doing a podcast with him at some stage as well, but he's, um, he's a good one to check out for sure. If you're looking for someone who's like, if someone's listening to this and they're thinking these two guys aren't that credible when it comes to powerlifting, um, Dawson is a really credible source for, for that. And I know, I know there are a bunch of others. Um, I mean, Ben's done some stuff with Steffi Cohen. She can do sissy squats. Um, he's also worked with another guy who squatted a thousand pounds after improving his knees, uh, working with Ben. Uh, so there, there are a number of stories that I know of, and there's probably a lot more that I don't know of and that have told Ben and haven't told me as well. But, um, but yeah, anyways, enough about, enough about the powerlifting. Um, you've recently like exploded your social media. So you've, you've kind of taken that on. Is that like, did, did Ben kind of, was that part of the training sessions there where he's like, Hey, you should, uh, you should get some viral videos going as well. Or, or how did that, wh- where did that start? Zero, not at all. It, and what's actually funny is that I developed a relationship with Ben. We became friends. I'm working with ATG. I'm here for almost six weeks in the gym, filming these videos. I started, my account was at maybe 600 followers on this account I now have, and now it's at 16,000. And for the first six weeks, Ben didn't even follow me. He, He never saw my page before in his life. He had no clue I was doing that. And that was zero hero part about kind of what we're working at. He just wanted to help me get as fast as possible. Um, So for me, I, I've always taken the idea of like, don't ask for permission to go and grow, you know, like take initiative. You see an opportunity and 
just put in the work and then the people will recognize it if you're doing quality stuff. And so that was completely me. I went out of my way a lot. I also love, I love content. I've spent years failing at making good content. And so now I've refined it to where like, I think I know how to deliver a message and kind of use our social context, like trends and how to, you know, get attention and break pattern disruption, all this stuff. And now I can handle it without getting anxious. I used to not like content because I would make something I thought was amazing. And then I would get really freaking disappointed if it didn't do well. And um, so, yeah, this is the tip of the iceberg. This has been years in the making and I just started to actually have any kind of traction. So it's been cool. I think it happened right on time. If I was blowing up a year ago, I don't think I would have had a great message to share. I would have just been a big guy with a big plat or a guy with a big platform with very little to say. So, yeah, that was purely me. And it's hard to be around it, you know, and not try to emulate it. It's hard to be friends with you, with Ben, with all the staff here and just the growing community. I mean, even the ATG for coaches, I've met so many in the past month at the expo and it's just too inspiring for me to not try to share. And so, yeah, I mean, just trying to do my best with that. Um, I've been a student of your work big time. I love your content. It's literally saved me. I've probably watched more hours of your stuff than anyone else in ATG because you have so much on YouTube. The amount of times I refer people to your YouTube channel, like on a daily basis in the DMs, because yeah, I think I honestly believe that the videos you've done on, you know, the ATG principles, long range versus short range, the most important principle we're missing and all those videos is the perfect bridge from maybe someone coming out of academia or they have a good base knowledge of training, but they're totally foreign to ATG. Like it's delivered perfectly. So I think content is this day and age of encyclopedias and like information. So yeah, I tend to start going on rants. So you got to cut me off sometimes, Keegan. I'm realizing I'm just talking so much, <laughs> but. I appreciate, I appreciate the positivity around the, uh, the YouTube stuff. And yeah, it's, I, th I think people underestimate, like it's a challenge for me as well to hit the record button and to actually say, yeah, I'm going to go on, you know, I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to go on record with this, with the YouTube stuff. Like that, I kind of, I like, it doesn't sound very humble, but I think it's the best strength training information that's like on the internet, honestly. Like uh, I've watched like everyone's stuff. I watched like everything out there from every old school thing to every new school thing, athletes, you know, PhD guys. And it's like, I wish someone had just told me these principles like 20 years ago. So in some ways, like I think they shouldn't be on YouTube because it's, it's almost like people will easily gloss over. But then I do get a lot of messages from people who don't, aren't part of ATG for coaches and I even aren't doing ATG online. And they're like, yeah, this changed the way I think about strength training and I'm programming differently since I understood this. And um, yeah. it's, there's, there's some guys now who want to do research. There's someone who's doing research under Brad Schoenfeld, who's kind of the main muscle researcher. There's one of the coaches in the community now is trying to get a study done through them. Um, like I, I'm like almost skeptical or like I, I'm a little bit against the academic world because I was sort of in it and studying it and it didn't do me well. But, you know, ultimately it's great if the, that, that world also understands, you know, what, what is actually happening here. And, and I'm sure they can, um, they can explain it much better than I can. And they can like go in and, you know, do, do what they do. Like they know they, they do what they do well. It's just like, and there's there's other concepts here that haven't been on uh, they've been underexplored and i don't you know it's hard to sort of understand why after so long but um yeah. it's it's fun to think like i'm i'm really sure there're going to be a, a number of researchers and people way you know more interested in academics than than us who are who, who are going to also love doing the training and they're going to like get the results themselves and they're going to do yeah this, this needs to get into the into the research into the papers um yeah 
but yeah so with your uh with your like how has that impacted like your like your confidence and how you're looking at the future because it's it's such a big thing now people think they want to grow their socials like you've just done it like how 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 has it honestly like impacted your outlook for the future and your kind of self-image it's it's a kind of chicken or egg situation for me because I'm in such a different place of life overall now that it makes content easier. It makes it easier to publish content and share my journey because I'm also at the point where I'm finally living my ideal. Like I'm in a lifestyle and in a flow of things that I've always been trying to develop. And it took years to get community ecosystem, get the body I need. I mean, that's what you're all about. I know with this is an ATG podcast, but the stuff that you do with Uncommon Success and like of being healthy in the mind and body and developing skill sets and then financial literacy, like your ideal and all these things will literally change the way you feel each and every day. And then once you feel great each and every day, your confidence is there and you're extremely passionate about getting something out there to the world, it's honestly easy for me to record now because I feel like so grateful that I'm in this headspace and in this reality. And I just want to share and share and share. I just want to like help whoever is in the same spot I was in a year ago or two years ago, um, because that's what just brought me to where I'm at here. Um, Every time I make content, I literally try to think about like Brendan two or three years ago, what got me out of that? And it was seeing your content, it was seeing Ben's content. Like I know what it's like to really be stuck in hurting. And the only thing that ever got me out of it were people bold enough to go against the grain and put their ideas out for the world to judge. And that was you, Ben, a lot of people in ATG, other mentors, and to be in a position like maybe I could do that for someone. I got over the nerves and the pressure and like the self doubt of it because um, for me, I'm just happy with my life and like grateful and I want other people to have that. So um, that's, that's where I'm at with this. Definitely changed my life for a, a number of reasons. And what's also helped is like, I'm learning one of the, things Ben has taught me about content. I would recommend everyone to think about this for whatever they're trying to deliver is he makes it very simple. Like whenever he tries to put a video out, he's trying to educate and lead by example. And that's his entire approach. And so if he makes it fun or interesting, that's cool. Sprinkle it on there. But like the reason why he's making content is to try to educate someone on a topic that he knows there's a gap in and then show with social proof of himself or other people, no, this really can be for you. Um, And so that's one of the biggest things is just like, you start to feel like you have to put out content. If you're trying to grow it, especially in fitness now, you're going to be told content is king. Oh, I have to get on these platforms. And you can kind of get pulled into like, okay, well, what's working on the platform? So I guess I got to dance on TikTok now, or I guess I got to start, you know, using all these trending sounds. And it's like, you might do okay from that route, but to really be groundbreaking, it's like probably closer to your true message and your true beliefs. So get really clear on that. And then learning how to put that into a video is, is secondary. Um, But yeah, long answers always for me. I'm sorry. I just start going and going. That's what, that's what people want to hear. And they want to understand like what's going on inside your, your mind and how you've, you know, gone from 600 followers to 16,000. And what's interesting about that is also like that, that trajectory Um, we've seen, you know, there's Matt Scar who's gone from maybe 300 followers to like three or 4,000. I'm not sure exactly his latest numbers. I get, I get scared now because you guys are growing so fast that I can like <laughs> undershoot by a big chunk, but he's had a couple of posts go to like millions of people. And I know that that's really changed the way like he's thinking about his own future. And 
you know, he knows now that he can really impact a lot of lives. Like he was a Div 1 soccer player and he had some serious issues. And now he's like, well, now I can actually do something about that. Like we were on a call yesterday and sort of saying like, well, what if, you know, what if you had a program that became like the norm that Div 1 soccer players or people who wanted to go Div 1, that, that they all did it. Like that it was like a, a prerequisite kind of understanding. Like what if you try to make, what if you made that program and made it available? And it was, you know, he was kind of, and like falling into the thing of like, well, I probably should offer like high end online training and, and you start to form like templates rather than what do I actually want to do? Like, what is my mission? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was that Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Matthew's Okay. Great guy. Yeah. I met yeah. him. Though. No, his story is great. And it's, it, it's so man, the, the biggest thing I, I wish I could tell myself a year ago with content is just, really be patient and protect like what fires you up and you have a you have just like this inclination towards like you just feel oh this is on the verge of something like when I found ATG and saw the building of ATG for coaches on the side and learned what you were doing I was looking at this like this is going to change the world I don't I wasn't making content like that at the time I was trying to get sales and funnels and leads because I was an online fitness coach being mentored by salespeople, not by people trying to actually like make solutions in people's lives. And this isn't to bash anyone. I learned a lot about sales, which is a great tool. But like, do I want to make content to try to make money and get someone to DM me so I can get a sales call? Or do I lean towards being more patient and like, going with what I know will really change the world over time. I, I eventually made that shift. And what was funny is like, I stopped trying to blow up and I blew up. And <laughs> as I was back when I was trying to catch every trend and play to the tiny psychology of people's like attention and all this, I never really made traction. And I blamed the algorithm. I was like, this is rigged. It's not meant for me. I'm shadow banned. It's, it's just not fair. And yeah. now I look back at that content and I cringe and where like now I'm just proud that like wherever the, the rewarding part for me is wherever the responses come in of like, this was made for me. Wow. This is exactly where I'm currently at. And cause I know if 10 people message that then probably hundreds feel that way. And then probably yeah. that are going to see it that way. And like, it's just, I I can't be motivated enough by impact. Like it just does so much for me when it reaches people. Um, if you make content to try to get 10,000 views, you're not going to stay in it very long. You're going to be, you're going to be cooked and just mentally drained. Probably it's, it's a different form of the rap race, man. Social equity is real the way you feel about it is very similar to how money can make you feel. And, you know, it's easy to say that now on this side of it where I'm doing well, but I know what it's like for years to struggle with social media and your message. And so I've just been learning, learning a lot from you guys too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we jump to that. Cause I, I slept on floors in, in Latin America for a long while, like couch surfing and, and uh, backpacking and living on less than sort of ten thousand dollars a year, and I know you had some some times yeah. as well where you were you were living differently to where you are now. Like, how do you look back on those those uh, more challenging times? Oh man, well, it's kind of like all the cliches that you hear, and you you think, oh yeah, yeah, I know, it'll make it better in the future, it'll pay off. Now I can finally see it. But back then, I just felt delusionally driven. Um, but now I'm just grateful. I, me getting to where I'm at now with ATG and my own, you know, growth and building social media and building a community and following and and just everything that's changed is only possible because I have failed so many times with so many things. And it really like life is the best teacher and the difference between me and a lot of my peers that I grew up in, I have a lot of 
people that where I came from and grew up in are in a stuck place and they're struggling and like it, family too. And I think what is the only difference of like that keeps your mind optimistic for life? And it's like you have to be fighting for your ideal. You have to be fighting for like the direction you want your life to go in. And the further I got in like trying stuff and failing, the less I feared failing. And so I moved to New York City on my own to try to make my dreams come true in 2018. And then I was a college athlete, a student athlete, and I had financial aid issues. I ended up homeless within three months and I was sleeping on the train and I was couch surfing for the whole year. And uh, I still went to practice. And that's when I started content. That's when I started like this idea of working on skill sets that can actually help share the story, like over overcoming the knee injury of, you know, overcoming your bad genetics, your low potential. I was slept on for years and still feel like that. Nobody would have thought that I'd be where I'm at now in terms of athleticism, in terms of confidence. Like I was too shy to speak up in class. And now like I put out goofy content that is, you know, self-incriminating all the time. It's I'm a different person. And it only came from like getting beat up and just getting up and getting beat up. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm super grateful for all that. That's a whole nother podcast and like conversation that could go for a long time but um yeah that you know, context like, i think it's good for people to hear like knowing that you were that you were homeless and that you kept the you kept the faith during that and you know you just kept learning and building skills and i mean you're still very young um but i think that gives a good context so like where what is that then what is that the foundation for? Like what's, what's coming next for the ATG sprint time? We know the sprint times and we, we got a bit of a feel for, okay, there's a long-term plan here by, by, I guess by 25, you know, maybe you're planning on 25, 26, running some, some, some really sharp times. Like yeah. what else, what else are you thinking about? Like, um, so I'm, I'm like definitely uh clinically delusional with like the scale of which i believe things are possible <laughs> and so even like my dreams and goals that i share are really just like 10 percent of what i'm really thinking about and that just comes off arrogant or comes off you know crazy and like it definitely is but for me it's always ended up playing out it's just how long are you willing to wait like how long are you willing to be wrong you know if someone um I, I don't know I, a lot of advice from family and people that are older than me they're 40 and they're 50 and they're like well this is how life is gonna go and I totally respect <laughs> them an insight but none, none of us have lived more than once in this society I mean you can have your own beliefs about whatever but like in this time and age like this is all of our first times so what is the cap of like what you believe in yourself? And, and so I don't know why I just went on that philosophical rant of context, but for me, the goals I have are definitely based in feeling empowered and healthy in your body. And there's going to be the niche of fitness and athleticism, just because that's one of my passions for sure. Um, I want to be, as credible as I can be on anything I talk about. And so sprinting is something I'm taking very seriously. I want to be the most unathletic guy. Does that make sense? I want to be the least athletic guy to make it to the Olympics. Like, I think that would be groundbreaking because people ask me all the time, what are your times? What are your PRs? You can actually look up anyone's track times they're really good in track about documenting that so if you search brendan backstrom mile split you're gonna see how slow i am and you're gonna be like this guy's crazy and i definitely am but when you learn stuff like atg training principles and you feel the magic of it and that you get out of chronic years of pain 
that's just like, okay, so what if I kept doing it for 10 years? What's possible then? You know, like, and it's, it's a big mindset shift. And I think that's why the ATG community and ATG for coaches team are so like-minded in such a beautiful way because it takes a certain kind of, you know, openness to life and optimism to even believe it's possible to feel better, to not be in chronic pain, to, you know, break generational curses or like, you know, just social paradigms, like things you've, social heredity. You don't know why you think the things you do, but you just convince life is the way it is. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just very optimistic and think that training could be big. I'm going to try to do a lot with content. Uh, I really like filming. I really like writing. And for me, I get, I don't try to get hung up on what the tangible manifestation of the, the skills and passions will be. Yeah. I just, I become a really good video editor and content creator that I'm going to make some really cool stuff in the future. And it's probably going to help a lot of people because I also enjoy that, you know? So yeah, love it. I hope that there's some aspect of the question. I, I love it. All of- I, I, when I left professional rugby league, like I'd worked with a team that became like the world champion team. I was working with the highest profile athlete. Uh, there, were, there was nothing more that could be done in the sport that I was in. Like it couldn't get any better than the 2000 season that, 2013 season I was a part of but when I left that I gave strength training workshops and I said like the way the world strength trains needs to change like the way that we're doing things at the moment if you go into an average gym if you look at the strength of the average human it's not okay like it's not it's not okay we can't accept the way things are right now we know a lot more than this we can do a lot better than this and it has to change and I believe that like we can change this is was the message that I was telling at these seminars and one way or another, I felt as though I was going to be part of the world, changing the way the world does strength training. That's one of the key things that I had in my mind, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2000, and it wasn't really happening. And it was like, I was working hard and I was, you know, I was helping individual gym owners and they were becoming the best gym in town or, you know, a good gym. But now it's happened. Like now, it, now it's literally happened. And it was Ben, you know, it's Ben. But I'm, you know, I'm his cheerleader, and and I support him. And I've added, you know, a, a squeeze of lime, as as Ido would say. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm there with that. And and it's it's happened. You know, the way the world tra- trains has now changed. You go into any gym in the world, and you've got to find at least one or two people who are doing these movements now. They're they're doing tip raises. They're doing split squats. And sure, there's further it can go, and and it can be implemented better. And it's not perfect and, and we've got a long way to go and the equipment's changing and, and it, it's going to take time. But like, it's literally like what seemed ridiculous less than 10 years ago, like by 2024, you think of like where this is going to be like 10 years later, it's, it's a, uh, it's a real massive significant change. So it then becomes, okay, well, you know, if I was aiming too low with that, if I was thinking too small, like what, what else, like if, if another 10 years is going to pass, if I'm going to have the blessing of another 10 years, like what should I aim for in these next 10 years? And, you know, seeing Ben talking about the education system and, and building a school, you know, that, that fires me up. You know, we're, we're building a resort or a village in, uh, in Vanuatu, you know, the self-sustaining village uh, that people can go to to train and go to to like reform their life and, and make a fresh start uh, yeah. that has food production and it's like just pristine in nature, 10 minutes across the water from an international airport, like, Imagine you take a flight, you get off, and you arrive to a place where the high standards of, of ATG and uncommon success are the norm, and you live in that environment for a month. Like, this is like, you know, you have these like rehabilitation clinics for people who've lost their way. Like, what about for people who are kind of doing okay, but just feel like they want to they want to be like that, you know, that Jocko Willink or that Ben Patrick or that Joe Rogan or, you know, how do we, is there a process that humans can go through where they become successful, entrepreneurial, get, you know, get the body, um, build that mindset. Like I, I believe like from my time in professional sport, I, I believe it's possible. Like I've seen 
average guys who grew up in pretty shitty environments who didn't do well at school, who are naturally kind of lazy, just be exceptional and, and, and just hold themselves to a really high standard and then bring other younger players along to that standard. And, and I've seen that that environment can be created for people to thrive in. And, and then, but, it, but where does it exist outside of pro sport? Like, how do you get yourself into that environment? ATG for coaches is probably, you know, one of the best things that you can do. But my dream is that there's a place in every city where when someone decides like, hey, it's time for me to level up, I want to be part of something bigger and better, that there are other people that they can go and, and spend time with who've made that decision who are either just starting like peers or they're a little bit further along in the process. Um, and I think, yeah, it's happening for ATG for coaches and, and, I, and I want it to be available for for everybody, like with the, uh, that's kind of the vision with the uncommon success, like for those who choose success and those who choose that they, they, they know they want to do the work, like that's a place where you could have gone and maybe you could have slept on the floor in one of the gyms of those places and had someone right. say, yeah, stick with it, brother, like, cause you know, I've been there as well. And this is, this is where we're headed. Um, yeah. That's, that's the, that's, that's kind of where we're, where I see it going. And, and I think like, I was really excited to have this conversation today because I didn't know you very well. I know you yeah. are better for the last uh, hour and a bit, but um, there's, there are a lot of people out there that are on this path, you know, that, that want to be more like where you are right now. And I think this, this content makes it a little bit more accessible. Like, yeah, like there's, there's, there's something I can do here. Like there's things that I see in this story that I see in myself. I'm just one year behind or I'm just two years behind. Or, you know, I'm at the same point and I know that, okay, we're going to keep going. Uh, yeah. That's so what, that's you, what. Everything you just said is amazing. And I, I, that's exactly the place I'm coming from when I get all excited and just start spewing out my, you know, ideas and optimism, like, cause it's, it's hard to deliver years of this equation kind of forming and you're like, I just believe in hard work and doing the right things, but it's not clicking and then it all clicks and you realize like it's, it all counts. And so now how do I fit that into in our podcast? Like what, what's the best way to distill all the emotions and opportunity I feel into a clear message. I'm going to get better at it. This is, you know, still early for me. It's fresh for me to try to share uh, my story. No one wanted to hear my story for years. And so the fact that I can even be on podcast now, I promise your story matters. Um, you specifically, Keegan, but also like the viewers and anyone that is in the network community. Uh, I am a true example of like no different than anyone else. Um, and, you know, it's, I agree with you. I think one of the, the best things we can do is make it a less a less lonely journey in self-improvement because tons of people want to work on themselves it's just sort of a trivial thing because i feel like the natural route for people in maybe american society whether we realize it or not is to get by and the like just to get by whether it's financially or even finding the balance of work life what makes you happy or not by the age of 18, you give up on the whole idea of like, I'm going to be an astronaut, firefighter, live my dream, because now you have to do taxes and, you know, you, you get the feelings of responsibility, which, of course, is a real thing. But, you know, when I, I'm honestly, I think the only reason I take the chances I have is because I came up with a lot less. And so I really do appreciate things more. And that's just honest self-awareness. So when I had even sprinkles of advice or mentorship, it was scripture to me and I would risk my whole life for it. And it's because I realized like just getting by is already so hard. It is really hard and painful to just make rent or to just have a decent job or just have, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's no easy route in life. It's going to be hard no matter what. So why would I not freaking go for it? Like, that is the one thing I wish I felt even more a couple of years ago was just like, you are undershooting in life. Like you are selling yourself short for whatever you think is crazy. You're selling yourself short and that's okay. You're going to realize that as you accomplish the goals and make bigger ones. Um, 
but there's just so much to be changed in the infrastructure supporting that. Like, and I think yeah. that's where for like the big solutions, like the curing disease, preventing it before it even happens, the education system and how we make happier, healthier people. How do we prevent atrocities in the world? I don't think it happens in debates of short solutions. I think it comes with cultivating wholesome people that love their life. And that starts with having a dream, having a healthy body, or just something you're passionate about that you can pursue every day. You yeah. know, I feel that now, but I know what it's like to be like, wow, I'm never going to be an athlete because I'm injured. Or I, I grew up extremely poor, not having food, you know, like, and how do you break that? How do you break the, the mindset of like scarcity when you come up with that? You know, it's so bold of you to think you can change your whole trajectory of life, but meeting people like you meeting an ecosystem that's just in that direction. It's so hard to stop the, the momentum, you know, you can't stay neutral on a moving train. So if we're all pushing to make the change and you're on board, you're going to be in a good spot. So like you said, that resort, that, that kind of environment to have people like, make it just as normal as all the other, like you said, we have rehabilitation for people that are completely down and out struggling. Well, why are we not pushing to have people feel completely empowered and grateful? And I think the impact just multiplies tenfold that way. So, man, I'm so passionate about it that I just start freaking going <laughs> Well, then, about it. this is this is i think uh, this is this is us this is this is the truth that we, we've got to and i mean the conversations that i get to have with ben from time to time it, it he always expands my vision as well now like uh some of the things that he said to me over the last sort of 12 months just like it's it they it just rattle around in my head for like days of like okay like he's going there where am i going you know and it's just like it's yeah. it just makes me about leveling up and you know how you know, what, where am I, where am I come along with this? And it's challenging for sure. Like to be sitting alongside Ben Patrick for the last, you know, four years and see him do what he's done uh, and, and obviously try and contribute wherever I can, but like he, he's going so fast, so, so high and he's, you know, he's gone to all sorts of connections and, and places that we couldn't even have dreamed of when we first started talking in 2018. And, um, but I can say that like, as much as it's challenging to be around that people on that trajectory and, 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 and those things, like what's the alternative? Like, you know, it's, um, it is so right. fun. And I know that I can, because I'm listening to him and doing that and I'm thinking like, wow, like I wonder, I wonder if I can do anything even close to what he's thinking about doing. Then when I speak to someone who's got kind of low expectations for themselves, it's so easy for me to help them sort of see a little bit brighter future than the, what they could see right now. And I just see people, I see them light up and then I see them taking action towards it. I see them connecting with other people who are, you know, who can help them on the path. And I just, yeah, there's nothing better for me than, than doing this, you know, so teaching the, having the ATG system become clear and then encouraging and inspiring, supporting coaches to, okay, well, what's your part in this going to be? Like if you're, you know, you, you, you've got access to this the same as everybody else, like apply it as best you can in, in, in the area that you feel most excited about in your local community or in your specialized niche or your age group or your demographic. Like, um, everybody's got a job to play in the ATG for coaches community. But I mean, across the, every human, I think if, if we all just thought about it this way of like, we're all unique, we've all got something that we can deliver that no one else can deliver. And it's like, how much can we level up? You know, every, every human, if we just play it like a computer game going through the levels, I think uh, I think life will get better. We will deal with some of those bigger challenges that you're talking about. Yeah, and, and it's like, if you want to change your life, you don't have to get it all right. You don't have to change everything. It could really only take one thing, one aspect for a huge shift to occur and it yeah. breaks break through. Like me, I'm an athlete and I was injured and fragile and I wanted to learn more and I found HEG and ATG for coaches, which was just like 
a cool training philosophy. It was a new concept. It was in my training part of my life. That had nothing to do with relationships, with my day-to-day life, with my everything. And now this one specific niche of my life has changed everything, you know? And so find that thing and really just always be mindful of the character you're trying to develop and the person you want to become. And like, it might take years, it might take months, I don't know. But as you get closer with whatever that thing is, like your whole life could change and you just start to view it as such a, an open-ended question of life versus like this hard, stagnant, I have it all figured out. And if you think life is, is crappy, that's, that's a tough mindset to carry every day. It's hard to change that. Um, but now I realize like, I have no clue what will happen in five years. You know, like you said, we, things are growing so fast and there's so much changing in the fitness landscape. Well, it's spilling over to the education space. And then what if it goes to other sectors? And it's like, I'm just glad to be on board. Um, this is where like the community of individuals is sometimes going to be, that's going to be the, uh, heartbeat and direction of the message because each of us individually like you said you're around Ben all the time it's like man this brings out a lot of like questions for me it's hard to deal with you know even in the good optimistic times it can be a little bit of anxiety but the good news is like we're adaptive creatures and so if you're just in somewhere that you believe in you're doing uh contributing in some aspect you're going to be fine you know i've never slept at night with so much peace in my life because i just have good friends good colleagues good um and i'm working on stuff like i really try to keep life simple and how i view it and you know that can protect you from like the chaos going on every week and the like on the news or whatever might bog us down in the current situation. Um, man, there's, there's so much to learn. And so anyone that watches this is in ATG for coaches or they find the video or, you know, we shared it. So like they're already on the right track. It takes a certain kind of person to be receptive to a podcast like this. And especially to be an hour and 40 minutes into it, <laughs> you're going to be all right. Whoever that person is. So you know? Yeah, we were. Yeah, I think I think we gave a lot there today, Brennan. If people want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to to see more from you? Yeah, HG Sprinter on Instagram. Um, I'm on all the platforms and TikTok and YouTube and stuff, but I'm most accessible on Instagram. I I DM everybody back. I am not big time, so you know I love conversations with people and trying to help. So I just reach out anytime we can talk. Love it, man, and um. So grateful to have this conversation with you and the journey that you've been on sharing uh, a little bit of that with us today and look forward to the next conversation and and hopefully uh, getting some training together and maybe an in-person podcast uh, later this year would be would be a lot of fun let's shoot for it as you said it now it's on the record i'm gonna make sure it happens for sure that's awesome all right we're gonna speak soon appreciate you thank you i appreciate it